and uh, the first admitted advice was, see everyone naked, <laughs> that's not going to work here. And then my hypnotherapist said, I must just relax, that's also a little bit difficult. Cause... So the method that I'm going to use to just get into it is just, I see so many familiar faces here, which really um, pleases me after being in the ISP industry for approximately 18 years and still seeing the same people, people that taught me and people that helped me along the way. So there are many anecdotes I can tell along with this journey. So I'm going to explain to you um, a bit about um, the history of Snowball. And then um, Snowball was started in 1998 with my brother and myself. And uh, we're also a founding member of WAPA, which is great because I see all the WAPA signs here, so I feel right at home. And then recently in 2015, this year, six months ago, we were purchased by Eurotel, so we're part of Eurotel as well. So I'm going to tell you about the story. So, um, yeah, the topic at hand, really I've broken it down into the words. We've got what is a partnership? I mean, that is probably the most obvious question. And I'm sure all of you have thought about that quite a bit. How does one leverage a partnership? Uh, why is it relevant to technology? I'm a technologist, so I'm going to put in how we use partnerships in technology to achieve uh, a greater leverage. And then we have uh, what are the success factors? Okay, the business part, that's very important. Um, how is it relevant to business? What are the success factors in a partnership? And then I'll tell you about my experience so far with the Hillertel partnership. Right. So, uh, very brief history. Uh, Snowball was founded by myself, my brother, in 1998. We did a web design and hosting services for approximately six years. And then in 2004, we decided to do some connectivity. There was an opportunity that arose. I'm going to tell you about that in a second. Okay, so basically what happened was, here is my brother and I working from home, and the house is getting a little bit too small, and you know, we need, we need an office. And we're like, ah, what are we gonna do? Because now we have a server. And the server's hosting my mom's website, brother's website, a couple of email addresses, and we've got a server, we've got to move the server somewhere else. So we hook onto this thing called wireless. We hear that there's this amazing technology, it works over a local area network, and you can send a land signal across a radio, and we were like, this is just too good to be true. So I phoned some company, they said they do wireless, they never pitch. I think, nah, it's nonsense, not possible. But then one day, Bertus of Miro, who comes, comes to me, he says, no, he's starting a new business. He's, job, he's quit his job now at Beltron, was the, I think, operations director. Came to my house and he says, no, he's also now doing this wireless thing. So I'm going, like, yeah, no, it's not possible. It's impossible. He says, no, I've got the stuff in my car. So he gave me two scenario radios. I put up my first wireless link, and needless to say, I was completely hooked after that. So, yes, that was a big opportunity for us because I'm from the Winelands. We live here in Stellenbosch, and there were many farmers that contacted us in those days saying, you know, guys, you must really make a plan for us because there's no ADSL. The copper infrastructure is absolutely terrible. We've got sometimes a ISDN, but it doesn't always drop the line, costing us a lot of money, and we really need you guys to give us a solution. So we were like, well, we've got the solution, we've got the technology, we've got a supply channel, everything's perfect. Yay, it's just going to work. But then there was apparently a little catch. And this is this little small sentence here. So there was actually a, a, in the rule book of ICASA a law that stated you're not allowed to send a, a radio signal over public road. So here we're all pulling our hair out. We're like, can't be logic. How can you have a law like that? And what I thought is, how can you inhibit technology? You know, we're working with the internet. How can you create something that, that you're going to, you know, stop from, from proliferating? So it just didn't make sense to us, and we said, ah, oh, well, let's just carry on and see where we go, see what happens. So, yeah, that was, uh, that was it. So all, all went fine and dandy for about a year, and then uh, one day we got a call, a very nervous call from one of our frenemies, I'm going to say, one of the other people who also ex started using this opportunity, telling us that ICAS has just switched off all the radios on Maastricht, and we are in deep trouble, and we all have to please come to a meeting. And we were like, come to a meeting with our 
competitors. That's bizarre. But it was nice hearing from these guys as well. So we thought, okay, let's go to this meeting. Yeah, and that was the inaugural meeting of WAPA. So we, we were, uh, there were eight people whose radios got switched off, and there were other four called. And then we got a really good lawyer, Dominique, who's also here today somewhere. Thanks, Dominique, for assisting us back when we went. So we had a meeting, and I think that was, for me, the first example of a, a partnership, an abstract type of partnership. Because here you have a whole bunch of guys, actually competitors, some of, some of us hated each other's guts, but on this day, we were all the best friends forever. We were like, we really need, we're in a bind, we need to sit together and figure this thing out. Because in our minds, we're not doing anything wrong, but there's the law, there's ICASA, and it's all very complicated. And it was such an amazing meeting and big journey that I started with a whole bunch of these other people that are still around today, all of them, about how you can actually work with other people, even though they're not your direct partner. So. Moving on. So business can be very lonely. That's why the slide's completely empty. Um, yeah, my brother was a minority partner. Six years my junior, more into graphic design, and I was like more the sort of computer guy into the network and that kind of thing, into the ISP part of, of the business. And as a consequence, if you're alone in business, you end up being taking a lot of responsibility. You've got all these balls to juggle. And the whole time, you've got, you've got to have these broad shoulders and come rain or shine, you just have to perform. And as a consequence, you, you end up walking this road. And actually, at one stage, I thought, no, you know what? I must advertise for managing director because I don't know about this whole business thing. And what about who's going to run this thing? You know, and like asking myself all these questions, put a little ad on the website. Managing director wanted for Snowball. I don't think we had any eats. We never had any applicants. About a year later, I pulled it off, and I was like, okay, I'm going to have to <laughs> walk this journey a little bit alone on my own. But still keeping an open mind and still trying to build the business, carrying on and on. So, okay, so moving on to what exactly is a partnership. So I've got there at the beginning a life, a life partnership. For example, getting married or, you know, living with someone. And I'm specifically mentioning that because I think, you know, we all... Do we work to live or live to work? And, you know, like if you visualize what you want in life, maybe in the opposite sex or the same sex, then you can actually uh, see a lot of attributes that you would want in a successful partnership. Business partnership, there's a common goal. You're working together. It's also about relationships. Your common goal, however, is slightly different. Perhaps in life you want to be happy, but in business the goal would be to make some money. So it's more intense than just, uh, uh, well, it's a different type of intensity. I also sometimes see partnership as something that extends beyond just a business, um, like a fellow director or, you know, one of your gurus or your engineers. You can also see partnerships in terms of clientele and supplier partnerships. Right. So the thing that you can use when you're in a partnership is you can leverage the other parties to assist you with and complement you, especially with what you're doing. So typical scenario might be technology business where you have a guy who's really strong technically, but you know, he's perhaps not so interested in the, the marketing aspect of the business. That would be an example where you can complement each other and the, the two parties could, could possibly grow as, as such. Sharing of responsibility, as I mentioned earlier, you know, running a business, you know, things go wrong, um, you need to motivate people. There are just so many hundreds of balls you have to juggle all the time. And in a partnership, you are able to effectively share this responsibility without taking the load on yourself. And then, of course, you know, it's nice going to a party and you know everyone there and that kind of thing. So having like-minded individuals around you and in your processes, in your where you're going, in in your journey, it's it's really a beneficial part of, of being in a partnership. And then, of course, the great thing is having all these resources at your disposal. Because as a solo person, you know you can only do so much. But if you can press a button and call a guy, somebody to help you, that kind of thing, which I used to do even when I wasn't in partnership, I'd find some random person, my competitor, whatever. It's it's a great way of reaching out and getting to more uh, 
continuity inside your business. So I'm just going to mention in terms of people, there's obviously the Bill Gates and Paul Allen example, Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak. When these businesses started, these guys were complementing each other and they were starting to build something of extreme scale. There are many South African examples um, that are also often quite good in the press. I think uh, there, was, there's, there was some nice one about on, on my branch band the other day about um, Afriost. And then, yeah, so business is a, it's a little bit complicated. Um, it consists of many different parts. And a partnership allows you to more rapidly accelerate towards this goal that you're trying to achieve, which is more normally profitability, as it should be. So I'm mentioning the suppliers and partnering with customers again as well. I'll, I'll elaborate just now on that. Right, so uh, let's talk a little bit about technology and being in wireless. Um, I, I'd say that we've been looking at this wireless thing for a long time and going, you know, it was great in 2005 and 2006 and this new technology and you can create all these amazing things. But the same situation doesn't exist necessarily in, in first world or other countries where the, there are uh, monopolies or, or much bigger firms, not monopolies as such, but bigger firms who've achieved these economics. The reason why we had this opportunity was really there was a problem and there was this huge opportunity problem partially being telecom at the time and so on. So basically the, 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 the issue with telecommunications is that eventually the, the streams get bigger, the economics of scale get more important and consolidation is something that, that we've been speaking about for years and there's a general trend starting to sort of go through the market where a consolidation is taking place. So, yes, as I say, is in the beginning, you know, it's a bit like Jan Faribe coming to get the veggies in Cape Town, you know, it was a niche opportunity and so on. But I'm sure sooner or later somebody else planted a vegetable garden. It wasn't so popular anymore. So you have this land grab situation right at the beginning of, of a technological evolution. And then you have the consolidation, of course. So in technology, again, um, when we look at building wireless networks, building high sites, you have a lot of bandwidth that you have to provision to the high site. Other, you have to get it there through unlicensed band, or microwave, unlicensed microwave. There are all kinds of different ways of getting your bandwidth there. Bottom line is the opportunity that we exploited meant that we had to share with other people. And if you didn't share nicely, you ended up having this interference problem. So in terms of actually getting bigger and better wireless networks, high site sharing, backhaul sharing is, is a phenomenal concept that's slowly starting to take place. It's taking place beyond, uh, by individuals who are actually willing to give and share their, either their space or their backhaul. It's, it's sometimes complicated, but the guys are doing it successfully are saving the radius to space and creating faster networks. Backhaul consolidation, yes, spoken about that. Open access fiber systems, not many customers are getting a lot more educated these days. So you see that some of these estates are absolutely insisting on, on open systems. Um, so there's really no way that they're going to allow three or five parties digging up the roads. So it's important for these guys to share as well. Right, so the relevance in business is that we have to, uh, it's, it's a type of a relationship that has to form um, and extending your network. So we all, you know, you might be isolated in a certain geographical region, but your network can grow a lot quicker by uh, hooking up with other people. That's why you have all these meets, that kind of thing. Um, and it's a, it's a type of a cooperative approach. It's really about saying, look, we're doing the same thing, you know, why work against each other when we can work together on something and achieve something a lot uh, quicker or a lot easier with a lot, lot less friction. So the ping pong, what I wanted to mention there is, is like, let's say for example you have multiple parties and the one party says it's so and the other party says it's so and you're the supply in the middle. 
my favorite thing is just getting both parties on the same conference call, and then you'll see that attitudes change, because being isolated on the one end, being isolated on the other end, you really need something in the middle to, to bring you together to facilitate that cooperation. And once that cooperation happens, the, the person that scores is your, your client. Right, so economics of scale getting more and more important. Uh, some of the products we're working with is commodities. You know, it's a lot of staunch competition in the market. You need to get those prices down all the time, get the economics up. So partnership can, of course, help you realize that. Uh, helps you, you know, your re negotiation with your contracts. If you have any large contracts bringing in data from overseas, you need to renegotiate. Uh, partnership can help you in that because there will be multiple parties, maybe perhaps buying from the same supplier. And then if you have a, a service that you wish to expand from your own region, as we all know, I mean, in spite of all this technology we're using all the time, business is still very much face-to-face. -face. The people we know, the people that know about us, you know, the guy you knew that you saw at the pub or wherever you saw him, you know, how people speak and how people still a human factor, there's this big human factor still all the time, I see that all the time, you think, now it's more and more automated, behind the scenes it's not, it's more and more face to face. So if you're going to branch out nationally or internationally, it's, it's virtually impossible to do without a partnership. There's no one way that a single entrepreneur can go and just quickly go and establish lots of different branches, you need some kind of a partnership. So, yeah, I've covered that last point. So yeah, so basically a partnerships, one of the great things, it, it does allow you to expand your, your business geographically. So I had to put a, a picture of my favorite, my favorite picture. That's just sort of off, off, off topic there, but if you think about it, from data coming in by the world and eventually reaching your customer, you had to actually uh, go, go through a lot of different partnerships. You had to have a supplier partnership. You had to get these guys to give you good prices. You had to sign multi-year contracts with these guys. You had to renegotiate. You had to get that data into your office. You had to uh, speak to your staff. You had to say to them, look, guys, we're going to get this data to our customers. You had to go and flirt with those customers, obtain those customers, and say to them, look, we are the best guy for you. We're not just your internet service provider. We are your partner in getting your stuff done. So partnerships can be seen across the entire supply chain. Right, so supply partnership, customer partnership, I've spoken about that a bit. So the closer you work with your supplier, you can get things done quicker, you'll build up better relationships, you'll get preferential pricing. Customer partnership, making your client feel like it's much more inclusive, it's a longer term relationship, more healthy. Um, something that's happening a lot now with, with our clients is we add them to a WhatsApp group, some of our resellers, and as a consequence, they've got always access to us. So it's something that they wouldn't have envisioned five or ten years ago, but, you know, you're really trying to bring those customers in, be, make them part of your organization so that you can grow together and, and always gain their trust. So success factors in partnership, many different things are required. But I'd say the, the biggest one is probably matchmaking um, because you need to f create some kind of a synergy or know about a synergy or is it trust your instinct with a synergy or not. You, know, you need to kind of figure this part of the, the equation out. Um, in, in my particular case, I got to know Uratol was one of my suppliers when they used to see me. They used to say, no, you should really meet Alan. And then when they used to see Alan, they used to say to him, you should really meet Eugene. And this thing was going on and on. And then eventually, Alan phoned me one day and he said, do you want to drink some coffee? And that's how the whole thing evolved from there. So there's a this sort of a matchmaking process. There's a huge trust issue, of course. You have to be able to trust. Trust, again, thinking of your relationships, letting go, not being selfish, but being able to also look after yourself, be happy. Same work ethics, kind of important. Very important, I would say. Same culture. I'd say open-mindedness is important. You know, this you, uh, partnership will expose you to many new possibilities. If you're able to, to think less conservatively, you will be able to, to um, just get them uh, into your stable easier. So there's a give-and-take situation.
Right, so, okay, so I've spoken about how businesses are more currently coupled to the customers, the WhatsApp example. Um, yeah, so I'd say partnering with your customers and suppliers, make them part of your DNA. So, okay, now just finally, getting to the last few slides. So, just going to explain how, you know, I had my baby for 17 years and I sold it to Eurotel, you know, that's kind of, it's quite a big thing, but I'm going to explain what's, what's happened since January 2015. So, the first thing is we've, we've had this amazing influx of, of technical skills. Um, before, you know, uh, ISP is this very technical business, internet can get super technical, lots of intense skills are required. A lot of those skills are not in South Africa anymore, or they're not available, or they're too expensive. Partnership helps you to, uh, in this case, here at all, help me with some skills. So we had a lot of bandwidth constraints. I mean, we started with a 32 kilobit line in 1998, and I think then we had a, you know, like a proper 64K line, then 160K, and these days we're talking about, you know, data center, multi-gigabit lines. So going from that evolution, you know, there's a lot of uh, interesting situations that arise, constraints of growth, because you're growing almost as big as your pipe, and then your pipe's too small, and then you don't grow anymore. And I have this one guy working with me. His name is Adrian. I wish he could be here today, but he's, he's working. So, and he said to me that, he said to me, no, we're going to get 100 meg about two and a half years ago, or we need 100 meg. And then I said, yeah, she, now how much does that cost? And then, I, then he said, no, but we're going to get 100 meg. And then I said, no, it's impossible. And then he just kept on saying that. And what I learned from him is that he just believed that, you know, we will be able to access this amazing bandwidth, which will make our business proliferate, which, which happened through the Eurotel partnership. And then the national contracts, again, like I said, the constraints to growth. We were in a geographical region. Wisps tend to grow very nicely in their own region and where the buckies can take them and where they can put new towers. And then it kind of stops. Kind of, they're servicing the network. And either they're very brave and they're going to put up another business in another area or they just get stay in that area and the business starts stagnating because, you know, there's now competition and it's just sort of staying the same. So uh, the the... A partnership will open new opportunities for you that were never there before. Things that you might not have even thought about. So, and then, of course, it's no good just having new business, but you do need some backing people to help you, resources. So, okay, now also, I was just always my own boss, which is probably a problem at many times. But now I've got an executive team, uh, guys who are really so experienced in business that you know I can really look up to people like things I never had before, mentors, you know, coaches, you know, people that have just kind of solved a lot of problems that I've thought about and they've already solved these problems. So uh, the, the decision making process just becomes a lot easier in a partnership because of shared responsibility, access to some real brains. Yeah, and just doing essential work. I don't have to do any more. Um, we've got access to developed systems already, um, possibilities of customization these systems. And we're able to deploy our network a lot quicker than before, as in uh, by, by magnitude. So the net effect of partnership really is that it will lead to financial success. The right partnership always leads to financial success. And old Dave Mankis told me once, about three, four years ago, I gave him my business plan, and he just looked over it quickly, and he said, no, you're a fringe ISP. And I was like, what the hell's a fringe ISP? He says, you're always on the edge. You're like, like, not quite making it, but you're not going to go away. And so being a fringe ISP has kind of taught me a lot about survival and uh, perseverance. But finally, that's gone now, and we're now actually doing well. For, for long, for the first time. So uh, as the, the network expands, it's got a, its own network effect, and part of the network effect is that more business flows in because we do a better, uh, better way of working, cooperating in this partnership. And then, of course, the big picture. I'm part of something a lot bigger, which is awesome. Right, so before, some numbers there. Before... Uh, uh, Eurotel purchased us. We were 15 staff, and we'd been 15 staff for probably about 
five, six, years, seven years. So we had this amazing potential. We were like, you know, wow, this product's so amazing. But we couldn't really grow because we were constrained by resources and capital. And our business was very much limited to our immediate geography. We built quite a big network, but it's still, you know, where can a bucket go? And, you know, after two hours, you start losing money. After an hour, it's difficult. So, so yeah, we had extra and turnover. I was going to not put that in. So, and then the company structure was fairly, very limited, you know, because there are just too many balls to juggle in a business. So there were certain balls that I just couldn't juggle that well. Right, so that was before and after. So now we're 42 staff. Um, as I said, we've just got this amazing executive team, people that, that I rely on every day to assist me with difficult problems, business problems, mentoring, that kind of thing. And the first thing that happened from day one is I just had this confidence boost because I knew that I've got this amazing potential in me. And when I had all this backing, all these guys behind me, I went into places and did deals that I never thought possible, which is the best part. Um, so the pastel part is actually being able to, to draw what you want, you know, not just visualizing, thinking about it, but saying, okay, we want to do this. But it's a complex picture, so you do need these guys to help you. So, yeah, our turnover has gone up by four in six months. There's a graph from my book. I copy-pasted it. That's uh, November, December, January, February, March. So, partnership leads to a renewed growth and it unlocks potential and value. Okay, so summary, partnerships is the key to building a bigger business. If you guys show me a few people who can do it on their own, damn, they're good. Elon Musk, maybe. Larry Ellison, but nobody else. Give and take. The collective is that your customers win. Remember, while you're having all this fighting about, oh, is there a partner or not, whatever, customers are suffering. The moment you join hands with a partner, customers start winning. And then... What I've been taught is that go for win-win situations. When you're looking at a partnership, look at where you can win, where they can win, and hold hands that way. So my final question, the easy one, is one plus one. What sort of effect does a partnership give you? So it leads to exponential growth, a true snowball effect, and it's really a case of one and one isn't three or four or five, it's 11. Great partnership is something that really works well. Thank you.